Robert Spencer here for Jihad Watch, answering the question, what is Sharia? Sharia is the path to the water. That's what people will tell you. And it is a wholly benign system of individual religious practice for Muslims, the instructions that they should pray five times a day, the circumstances uh, under which they are obligated to uh, make ablutions before they pray, uh, various marriage laws, and so on. And it is with that kind of understanding of Sharia in mind that it is comparable to Catholic canon law or to Jewish law that Sharia advocates in the United States, including most notably the Hamas-linked Muslim Brotherhood Front Group, the Council on American Islamic Relations, have been fighting energetically against anti-Sharia laws all over the country, saying, this is just personal religious observance. How could you possibly object to this? You are a racist, bigoted Islamophobe because you want to interfere with Muslims practicing their religion in ways that you would never dream of interfering with Jews, Christians, Hindus, Buddhists, anybody else practicing their religion. It's pure Islamophobia. Well, I'm here to tell you that, as you might expect, that's not the case. The only reason why anybody cares about Sharia in the United States is because it is a comprehensive system of laws that includes not just individual religious observance, but a political system, and not just a political system, but a political system that is authoritarian, violent, and supremacist at its core. Sharia contains regulations that mandate death for those who exercise their freedom of conscience and want to leave Islam, for those who are deemed to have blasphemed against Islam by insulting Allah or the Quran or the Prophet or even by speaking honestly about their contents in ways that Muslims object to. Sharia mandates that women have a second class status, that they can be beaten when they're disobedient, that the value of their testimony is half that of a man, that the value of their inheritance is half that of their brothers, that uh, they can be killed if they are out of line in terms of having sullied the family's honor by zina, some sexual indiscretion, that, they, that it is an honor for them to have their genitals mutilated and the sexual pleasure thus decreased so that they can be more easily controllable. These things are all aspects of Sharia. Sharia mandates discrimination against non-Muslims. It mandates that they cannot build new houses of worship or repair old ones, so their communities are always in a state of decline. It mandates that a Muslim man can marry non-Muslim women, but Muslim women cannot marry non-Muslim men, so that once again, the wife goes to the husband's household and the non-Muslim community is always declining. They cannot hold authority over Muslims, so that the non-Muslims are at the most menial levels of society, because they can't even have a small business in which they would employ Muslims. That's not allowed. They might have one in which they are all Christians or all other non-Muslims in this business, but even then they would always have to defer to Muslim competitors who had Muslims on their staff. So that you have, for example, the colloquial term, the slang term for Christians in Pakistan is sweepers. And many times you will see news items where Muslims are speaking derisively of the sweepers because the Christians can only hold the most menial jobs in society and they sweep the streets. They are sweepers. Now, this is all considered to be the divine law, the law of Allah, the perfect and immutable law of Allah. Chapter 5, verse 3 of the Quran says, This day I have perfected your religion for you. Those who are holding out great hopes for Islamic reform should ponder that. How can you reform what's perfect? How can you reform what you have been taught is something that is already in its best possible form? It can't be done. Now, the Quran is also many times telling us that we must obey Allah and his messenger, that we must obey Allah and Muhammad. But very little is said about Muhammad in the Quran. He's only mentioned by name four times, and there is uh, there's quite a lot of reason. You can see my book, Did Muhammad Exist? Quite a lot of reason to doubt that those actually even refer to Muhammad themselves, and that's only four references. So, how do you obey the messenger? You have to go to the Hadith. The Hadith are the voluminous corpus of what Muhammad supposedly said and did. The reports that are deemed authentic are considered normative for Islamic law. Quran plus Hadith plus the Sirah, the biography of Muhammad, that's the Quran and the Sunnah together, make up Sharia when codified by Islamic jurists. Now, 
once you have Sharia, the law that is codified from the statements of Muhammad and the statements of Allah himself in the Quran, those are the two highest authorities. There is no appeal from them. It is not for an individual Muslim to dispute, as chapter 33, verse 36 of the Quran tells us, what has been settled by Allah and his messenger. So it's the perfect and immutable law of Allah, and it mandates all this oppression. This is why there are anti-Sharia initiatives in many states in the United States today, and why there should be more. People have to understand that Sharia mandates that no non-Muslim has any authority over a Muslim or can by right exercise any such authority. That means that all governments that aren't based on Islamic law are illegitimate, and Muslims have the obligation to fight to undermine those governments and ultimately overthrow them and replace them with Sharia governments. Now this is an actively subversive imperative in that case. Sharia, when people try to act against it, is something that is a direct threat to the secular constitutional republic that the Founding Fathers established. The non-establishment of religion was one of the greatest strokes of genius in history, and I do not exaggerate, my friend, because the non-establishment of religion, the First Amendment of the United States Constitution, allows for the idea that people who disagree, as we all do, on the most basic questions, will live together in peace and harmony without one group trying to gain hegemony over the other. And the delegitimizing of any such successful attempt to gain hegemony. It is the only way that there can be a peaceful society in a world such as ours, where movement is so easy and where societies are of necessity pluralistic. And so, we have in Sharia a direct threat to that freedom, to the freedom of speech with the blasphemy laws, to the freedom of conscience with the death penalty for apostasy and blasphemy and heresy and so on. We have a direct threat to the idea of equality of rights of all people before the law and equality of access to services with the special privileged status that Muslims have in Sharia and the denial of basic rights to non-Muslims. So of course, anybody who is interested, anybody who likes living in America as a free republic, anybody who likes the idea of the freedoms that are guaranteed in the US Constitution should be opposed to Sharia. And those who aren't and those who obfuscate and say that Sharia is simply a matter of personal religious observance, they're not being honest. And you gotta think, when people are not being honest with you, they may not have your best interests at heart. I'm Robert Spencer, thank you. Mm -hmm.